Good morning. We'll try that again. Good morning. Welcome to St. Luke's. I am Pastor Schmidt, and this is a great place to be. We sing our Lord's praises, we spend time in prayer, and we allow the Spirit of the Lord to work on us. He speaks, and then we respond through prayer, through praises, through a resounding amen. In worship, we come into the presence of our God. We are in the Easter season still, and so it's very appropriate that we have the Easter acclamation. Hallelujah! Christ is risen! Our first song will be done by our choir. We continue with the invocation. Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and, for his sake, forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, bridegroom of the church, you have done everything needed for us to join you at the heavenly wedding feast that has no end. Guide us so that our thoughts, words, and deeds may testify that we are no longer wed to this world, but are yours now and always. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. We confess our faith together using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated.
first reading for the fifth Sunday of Easter is from Acts chapter 11. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them? But Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying. And in a trance, I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners. And it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were sent to me from Caesarea. And the spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. And he declared to you, and he will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. 
If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God saying, then do the Gentiles also? God, then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. This is the word of the Lord. We read the gradual responsibly. Christ has risen from the dead. He has given him dominion over the works of his hands. The epistle is from Revelation, from the Revelation to St. John, chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God and he will be my son. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise. Alleluia. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 16th chapter. Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he has said to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, What does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, is this what you are asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while and you will see and you will not see me and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also, you have sorrow now, but you will see, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated, and I invite the children to join me up in front for the Lamb's message. All right, I want to direct, thanks for coming up here, guys. I'm going to direct your attention to the picture. What do you see in the picture? Pick out one thing that you see. Angels. Angels, and they have kind of horns, and the horns kind of are curly cues. Yep, so you got angels up there. What else do you see? Cubes. 
You, you see a what? A man with a sheet. Is, is the sheet around him and on him? So, okay, yep, there's a man up there, and the man has a beard, right? What else do you see in the picture? Do you see nothing else in the picture? What do you see? You, you had a queen. How do you know that she's a queen? She's got a crown on her head. What else do you see? What's behind the man? Yep, and we're going to call that a throne. And there's a lion up there. Ooh, up in front in the lower corner, that's the altar where um, they had the altar in the temple. And you see the four horns coming out of it. Do you even see the dove above the altar right next to the lion? I did not see that until first service. Somebody said there was a dove and I had to look closer. By golly, they were right. All right. So, you know what this is actually a picture of? It is a picture of Jesus and his bride. Did you know that Jesus gets married? You did. Did he get married on earth? He didn't get married when he had his earthly ministry. But you know what? He gets married. Does that not surprise anybody? It surprises you. Okay. Now, I'm going to read the verse. Now, this is from the book of Revelation. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Have you ever heard of a city looking like a bride? That's kind of weird language, isn't it? It's, it's from the book of Revelation, and it's got a lot of symbolism. Now, which basically means that there's code words. So when it talks about the new Jerusalem, you know what? That is the people of God who are in heaven. They are described as the city. Now, there's another word up there, another imagery. It's not just a city. And how would you dress up a city as a bride, right? It's hard to put a dress on a city, but it's symbolism. And it's talking about the people of God that are the bride of Christ. So that's us. We are collectively the bride of Christ. But remember, we're talking symbols and codes. When it talks about Jesus marrying the church, it means that he's committed to his bride. So whenever you see, have you ever gone to a wedding? Raise your hand if you've gone to a wedding. Some of you have. All right. The bride and groom are committed to each other. They're saying, I'll give up all, even my very life, rather than fall away from you. I love you so much. That's what Jesus says to us. He, he says that he's committed to us, his church. And then, lo and behold, the church says that same thing back to him. I love you. I'm committed to you. I want to be near you. And that's what Jesus says for us. How do we know he loves us? Because he died on a cross to pay for our sins. I want you to fold your hands. Close your eyes. And you say what I say. And adults, please be involved with this. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for wanting to be near me always. Thank you for wanting to be near me always. Amen. Guys, thanks for coming up. And we do have children's church. You're going to want to follow Miss Jana if you want to go to children's church. If not, head back to your parents. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our text for today is um, from Revelation chapter 21, but I also want to um, first hit on the gospel a little bit. It, it very much talks about Jesus going away, and uh, it's getting us ready for the ascension celebration. Um, if my calculations are correct, that happens on Thursday, and um, it, it really is one of those high holy festival days. Jesus ascends into heaven. The, the laws of gravity don't, do not contain him, 
and he just floats up into heaven. We have a God that's all-powerful, and um, the, the text today remind us, even though he will be going away, he, he is with us always. Revelation talks about a wedding. Weddings are fun. Um, this wedding happened here last year, July 2nd, 2021. Jacob and Laura, um, I texted them yesterday, sent them this picture and said, I'm using it. And they said, thumbs up. And, and they were here at the first service. And um, even the, the, uh, um, most str the strongest Tom girls, Tom, Tom, I'm sorry, tomboys. That's right, tomboys. The ones that um, um, are able to be rough and tumble with the boys, they'll get dressed up on their wedding and they'll curl their hair and the makeup and, and they're, they're just beautiful. We know that happens at every wedding. They adorn themselves for their husband. Um, very first wedding happened in the Garden of Eden. He, Genesis chapter two tells us, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. Um, the only witnesses there were the animals. Apparently when you're God, you don't need other witnesses. And he is the officiant at this wedding. And it didn't take long for this wedding to go on the rocks. So the imagery here is they get married and then they have their reception and they go and eat food and their meal is with Satan who convinces them to eat from that tree that they're not allowed to. And boom, they fall into sin. And their marriage would now be full of strife and misunderstanding and selfishness and a lack of leading on the man's part and a desire to d dominate on the woman's part and a loss of love and bitter words and other great shame and vice. This is what sin looks like. If you have your sermon notes available, uh, if you grabbed one from the back, there's a blank there, the yellow highlight points that out. Um, you'd wanna fill in the word sin there. This is what sin looks like. It is ugly. Sin is being divorced from God and being married to the world. Fallen human nature is wed to the most domineering and abusive spouse there is. For the devil himself is the prince of this world and is its main agitator. We need to make sure we understand how God views things. What is his worldview? Because I guarantee you Satan is going to pick all the opposite things of that. And the world speaks boldly, loudly, and saying, you need to, to do these things. You need to feel this way. And lo and behold, it very much violates what God wants from us. And so it's very important that we, we understand what God tells us and what he expects of us. Because Satan, he is an ugly taskmaster. He wants only our demise. He is truly wicked. Uh, he is truly wicked, and his goal is to make sure that we experience pain and ugliness in our lives. Well, in our text, the angel announces a wedding between Jesus and the church. Verse 1 tells us that there is a new heaven and a new earth. The, the former heavens and earth have gone away. And then there's a line that says, and the sea is no more. In the book of Revelation, the sea is symbolism for sin and, and tumultuous. And then you actually get a picture in Revelation, a chapter earlier where the sea is as crystal clear. So it's not tumultuous. So sin has been, um, if you will, restrained. Well, here in this, it's all gone. So this is definitely the new heavens and the new earth. It is the last day and beyond. And I saw, this is verse 2, the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. We definitely have wedding language going on there. The word adorned, it is, the Greek word is cosmeo. Sound like anything to you? Cosmeo. What does that sound like? Cosmetic. Cosmetic. There you go. To adorn. And you do that with makeup, right? And other things. Um, I, I like the translations here, to adorn, to decorate, to embellish with honor. And so um, uh, that's what you have going on where a, a wedding is happening and, and the bride is adorning herself for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. 
Now, dwelling place, both times, it comes from the same root in the Greek language. One is a noun, one is a verb. The word is tent. Not just dwelling place, but he tented among them. And you have to go back to the Old Testament. I, I mentioned it last week. The book of Revelation is a mosaic of the rest of the Bible. So when you hear the word tent, you've got to go back to the story in the wilderness where God has the tabernacle amongst his people in the very center of it. God is present there. How do the people know that God is there? They can see the pillar of cloud by the day, the pillar of fire by night. And God is leading and directing them through the wilderness. And so um, our text tells us that, behold, the tent of God is with man, and he will tabernacle with them. You've got to go also to John chapter 1, where it says that Jesus not just dwelt, but Jesus tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so John also, not only in the book of John, but here in the book of Revelation, is pulling from that theme in the Old Testament. God being in the midst of his people, he is there present. Verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be any mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Our Lord makes all things new. And he takes that which is broken and he fixes it. And he takes the hurt and the pains that we experience in life and he says, at the end of time, there will be no more hurt and there will be no more pain. I will be in the center of things and we will do away with all of those ugly things in life. Jesus, God incarnate, found his bride, the church, and she was shut up in a room of death. And so the imagery here is that the bride has wed the world and Satan, and he is an ugly taskmaster, and he has her um, enslaved. And yet Jesus comes and woos her, speaks kindly, t tenderly to her, winning her over, and we know that happens through the, the Spirit working through word and sacrament, where Jesus speaks to us. I love the picture here. It has all kinds of uh, flags of nations on the bride's dress, representing, of course, the church. You have to jump to Ephesians 5 then, where it says, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her. Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, the church for 2,000 years has understood that to be baptism. There are a couple churches that came out, uh, uh, um, that popped up about 200 years ago that would like to argue that. But again, the, um, the church has been pretty consistent over 2,000 years that um, cleansing with, by the washing of water with the word is what happens in baptism. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and blameless. I want you to keep in mind, how does the church adorn herself? It's through Christ. He's the one who makes her spotless, no wrinkle or any such thing, no blemish about her because of Christ. Christ lays his life down for his bride, the church, and wins salvation for her, and then dresses her in a robe of righteousness, and she is beautiful. And that's talking about you. You are the church. When we talk about weddings and, and the wedding motif in Scripture, we got to bring up Hosea. Hosea is an Old Testament prophet, and God tells him to marry a prostitute. Her name is Gomer. And uh, Hosea does. And then Os uh, Gomer... She wanders away from Hosea and becomes unfaithful to him. And God says to Hosea, go back and get her and bring her home. She is your wife. And Hosea does. It's a picture. Hosea represents God and Gomer represents the people of God who have, and to use the Old Testament language, 
whored after other gods. We have continually gone away from our, if you will, our true husband, and he has continually gone out and sought us back. That applies for us too. It doesn't matter where you've been in life. Know that our Lord desires to bring you home. <coughs> Maybe this is your first time back in church in decades. Maybe you know somebody. Maybe you have a family member who hasn't been to church in years and has wandered away from the Lord. Know that it is the Lord's desire that that person be brought back close to him. Well, the first wedding was a match made in heaven, right? But by the reception, it was already on the rocks. Now, we know they stayed married, but they also um, had a married life together full of sin. Well, exactly the opposite happens with Christ and his church. It begins on the rocks with the death of the groom. Always hard to have a marriage, right, when the groom dies. But we know that God changes the, the narrative. In fact, Jesus rises from the dead. And in him, there is new life and there is new hope. The last day will be a wedding feast of the Lamb and his church. The Lord's Supper we're going to experience later on is just a foretaste of what happens at the end of time. What happens at the end of time? God gives himself to us. And we get forgiveness and life and salvation. And there is incredible joy there. We are restored, and we get just a foretaste of it here in the Holy Supper. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. How many of you have seen that movie? <coughs> Good deal. A fair amount of you. Um, 20 years ago, this was really popular. The, uh, in the movie, it says that any worthy person who drank from the cup and that is the chalice that Jesus had at his last supper. Any worthy person who drinks from that cup would live forever. Lo and behold, Hollywood put out bad theology. Who would have imagined, right? All right, we're, we're not worthy. That's the whole point of Scripture. We are not worthy, but rather Christ then bestows on us his worthiness. He puts his blood into the chalice, and we experience him. And all that he won for us, forgiveness, life, and salvation, is then connected to us. He's the one who makes us worthy. Jesus comes as the heavenly bridegroom for his bride, the church. He comes after us. He pursues us. We covered this last week in when we looked at Psalm 23. Um, at the end of Psalm 23, it says, um, he follows us. The word is actually pursue or chase after. He chases after us with goodness. He wants to bestow on us his loving kindness. He doesn't just follow after us like a, a puppy dog. Um, he is a hound dog going to get us so that he might bless us with good things. On the last day, we, the church, are joined to him forever. And just like in an earthly marriage, when one person dies, the marriage is over, there's no more death. So there's that, that marriage is, is never over in heaven. We are forever joined to Jesus. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in and through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We continue by singing our post-sermon song. We remain seated.
I have a few announcements we want to go through. You have attendance cards or communication cards right in front of you, and we encourage you to fill those out, and we encourage you to put down your contact information, especially if we do not have it. They will go in a wicker basket in the back. We have a door offering the third weekend of every month, and this weekend is the third weekend, and it will be going to Helping International Students, also known as HIS. We have Vacation Bible School coming up. I hope this is on your calendars, June 5th through the 9th, from 6 to 8 p.m. each of those nights. It goes from Sunday night through Thursday night. We need adults to be involved to make sure that this runs. So if you're not signed up yet to help, please consider doing so. Today we have a decorating activity. It'll go from 3.30 to 5.30. Hope you can help out with that. On Tuesday night, we have Dave Anderson and Roger Walk will be with us for a worship concert. They will undoubtedly be talking about the rescue story, um, the plane going down, as well as Shepherd's Canyon retreat, and they'll be raising money for that, so come with a generous heart. We are going to have a potluck at 6 o'clock followed by the worship concert at 7 o'clock. So please plan to bring something tasty to, to be enjoyed and shared. Again, 6 o'clock for the potluck, 7 o'clock for the concert. Now, this happens on both Monday night and Tuesday night. It's in Olathe, Topeka, and Lawrence. So you're going to have to drive if you want to go see it. This is The Matter of Life, and um, it's a two-hour movie um, all about the... the various aspects involved with abortion and some of the, the topics that go on. I really wanted to show you the trailer for it, and it, it lasts one minute, so here it goes. I think this is the battleground culture issue yeah. in America today. How is it that we can trust an organization for whom abortion is such an important part of their business model to simultaneously effectively prevent pregnancy and prevent abortion? The problem in America today is that people simply change the topic. The key to successfully talking about abortion is to try to bring the conversation back to one key question. When you're an obstetrician gynecologist and you're pro-choice, you have to decide whether you're actually going to do those abortions. I believe that being pro-life is the most progressive value that we can have. The abortion industry is most threatened by Christians engaging in pro-life work. Finding that pregnancy center was the only person I had to support me at that time. She's got to know when she takes that pregnancy test that her church is not going to treat her like the Pharisees tried to treat the woman caught in adultery. As a church, we can't just vote pro-life. We have to be pro-love. We'll have a value them both speaker at next week's adult Bible study time. It will be um, beginning at 945, and they're talking on value them both. If you have any questions about that, well, we'd certainly encourage you to join us for that. We have a voters meeting coming up next weekend. It is at 1.30, and we are electing half of our council and half of our chairs. We have um, people slotted for um, many of those positions, but we still do not have a stewardship chair, and um, we don't have a property management chair or a Christian care chair. The, a church this size should not have any vacancies on the council or elders, so please consider serving in one of these roles. Our early learning center is a family fun night. It will happen here on May 26th at six o'clock, which means we gotta clear out the chairs, and we've done that before, that's very possible, but if you can help with that, that would certainly be appreciated. We need auction items, so be creative about what you might share or not. I'm sure they'd be glad to take cash as well. Um, and they need treats for a treat walk, um, similar to what would have been a cake walk, but they're including other treats as well. If you can help out with this, it'd be greatly appreciated. Invite, bring, sit next to, and process afterwards. That's how we grow. Be thinking about who you're going to be inviting and bringing to church. Holy Communion. During Holy Communion, we receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in, with, and under the bread and the wine. We call that the real presence. It's more than just our connection, though, with, with God. It's connection with one another. So those who take communion, we embrace the same things. We, we understand the same doctrine. And, and so the altar and the pulpit are very much connected. 
it's a reminder, no unrepentant sin. So we're not having those hidden sins, but rather we're exposing them all before the Lord and we're saying, Lord, I need forgiveness for all of these. If you've not worshiped at our altar before, please visit with me at some other point in time or elder who's in the back. And um, a reminder about communion. We're gonna follow the pilgrim distribution style. We've been doing that for a while. We'll do this half of the room first and you'll file in first from that side and then you'll go this direction. And then when we get to this half, we're gonna file in first to this side and, and then um, uh, file on back to your seats. Let's bring the offering plates forward at this time. Please rise. Let us pray to God our Father on behalf of the church and all people in their various needs. You told Peter, what God has made clean, do not call common. Remember those people on the margins of society, O Lord. Provide caring people and institutions, open doors of opportunity, and free them from the results of their past poor decisions. Bridegroom of the church, in your mercy, Peter and the others recognized that they could not stand in God's way. Guide the church's clergy and lay leaders here and around the world to seek your will, Lord Jesus, working together creatively to find new ways to spread the gospel in accord with your will. Bridegroom of the church, in your mercy. Holy Lord, in John's vision you proclaimed, Behold, I am making all things new. Graciously work through the talents and knowledge of meteorologists, naturalists, engineers, and visionaries as they seek to find ways to renew the health of this planet. Grant that seed time and harvest, sun and rain, produce bountiful harvests that we, will, that we all rejoice in your many blessings. Bridegroom of the church, in your mercy. Lord over all, as you foretold, often we will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. So we see injustice, oppression, constant warfare, and unrest in many nations. Raise up wise leaders intent on serving their citizens, police and first responders foc focused on maintaining the peace, and armed forces determined to reestablish calm. Bridegroom of the church, in your mercy. Gracious Savior, by the faith given us by the Holy Spirit, we look forward to the wedding feast of the Lamb, who will end mourning, crying, and pain. Before we enter that time of rejoicing, we bring the petitions of people near and dear to us as they call out in sorrow through tears and enduring pain. Lord, we pray for our shut-ins. We pray for Ruth Kant and Helen Weeders. We pray for comfort and peace for the family of Kim, who passed away after years of fighting cancer. We pray, pray for the family of Abby Staus, a young mother of four who died in a car accident Friday morning. We pray for the family of Gloria, a cousin to Seth Wagner, who passed away on Tuesday. And we pray for the family of Bernice Waters, who passed away this morning. We pray for Dane Beichter and Nolan Heitman. We pray for Ron Brooks and Kelly Miller. We pray for Marcy Schnorr and Jessica. We pray for Liana Egan's brother-in-law. We pray for Heather. We pray for Amelia and Scott. We pray for Stephen. We pray for peace in an upcoming transition. We pray for a baby nephew as he recovers from having tubes put in his ears. And we pray for our upcoming voters meeting. We pray for single parents and their challenges. We pray for our military and their families. And we pray for our early learning center, its children, family, and staff. Lord, we give thanks for you being the good shepherd that you are. And we give thanks for moms. We lift up to you firefighters, law enforcement officers, first responders, and healthcare workers. And we pray for those who are in the military, as well as those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries. 
As fits your gracious plans, give them peace, joy, and relief. Bridegroom of the church, in your mercy, into your hands, Heavenly Father, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting that you have heard us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We continue with the preface. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Please be seated.
Our Lord has blessed us with himself. We continue with the dismissal. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Please rise. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we give thanks that here in time you have already assured us of our invitation to the wedding feast above. Keep the vision of that joyful eternity before us until faith turns to sight and we celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor, won for you by Christ Jesus, and give you peace. Amen.
on Tuesday for the concert.